Hello, Cliff Smith here. I am the Washington Project Director of the Middle East Forum. Welcome to our webinar and podcast series. Uh, thanks for joining us. And today's roundtable event is about Professor Jafar Mahalati of Oberlin College, uh, a former Iranian ambassador to the United Nations who is accused by many, including Amnesty International, of covering up for mass murder and the wider issue of Iranian influence on higher education in America. Uh, last week, we learned something very important, and that is after literally years of trying, uh, Professor Mahalati was placed on indefinite leave at Oberlin. Um, this seemingly small event, in many ways, is a watershed moment um, in the fight against the Iranian regime influence in the U.S., particularly U.S. universities. Uh, and the Middle East Forum has been at the forefront of this fight for years and has played a major role in this, as have a number of our allies in the Iranian expat community. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, just some info. We have five people on this panel, myself included. So we've got a lot to discuss and a lot of people with thoughts. So um, this will be a 45-minute um, panel or you know, webinar rather than our usual 30. We'll reserve the last 20 um, for questions. So feel free to start typing questions in the Q&A box as you think of them. Um, and we'll get to them when we can. Um, in the meantime, let me introduce my panelist. Um, first, let me introduce Benjamin Baird. He is a director of the Middle East Forum Action. Second is Susanna Johnston, I'm an investigative reporter with Focus on Western Islamism, a project of the Middle East Forum. Third is Benjamin Weinthal. He is the Ginsburg Milstein Writing Fellow at the Middle East Forum and a regular contributor to Fox News Digital. Um, and third, uh, excuse me, fifth is Laden, uh, Laden um, Bazargan, a former political prisoner, human rights activist, and a member of the Alliance Against the Islamic Regime of Iran Apologist, or IRA, all involved here played a role in middle in Mahalati's suspension. Let's start with Laden. Um, I know um, that you tragically lost your brother in nineteen in the nineteen eighty eight massacre in Iran, and that you yourself were a political prisoner at one point. Uh, can you discuss this and also discuss how you became aware of Mahalati as a professor and to start working on um, getting him ousted? Yes, um, hello and thank you for having me. After the 1979 revolution, actually the revolution was for freedom, justice, accountability, freedom of political prisoners, uh, democracy. But unfortunately, the mullahs, the uh, Islamists were able to grab everything or grab the power by killing everybody, arresting them, putting them in prison and showing the iron feast. Uh, and tons of people were put in prison, killed or um, or were forced to leave Iran. Uh, my brother Bijan Bazargan uh, was a student at London that he came back to Iran to rebuild his country. And while he was in London, he had done a lot of activities for the leftist party that he believed in. Uh, so in 1982, unfortunately, he was arrested. Uh, after two years of uncertainty, he was uh, given 10 year sentence that he had passed six and a half years. Uh, but unfortunately, he was executed. Uh, this is my brother. And this is my cousin, Faribor Zanishman. He was 17 years old when he was arrested in 1981. 12 days later, he was executed and they charged us the bullets they killed him with in order to show us his grave. My brother never received the grave. They never told us where he is. And they told my, my father that your son was an infidel and infidels don't have graves. So my parents died without knowing where he's buried. Uh, in 2020, after reading the report of Amnesty International about the 30th anniversary of the 1988 massacre of political prisoners, that in there 5,000 political prisoners suddenly were executed, including my brother, we realized that in Chapter 6, uh, in the list of people who were involved in this atrocity, Mohammad Jafar Mahalati's name is in there as the ambassador of Islamic regime to the United Nations. We googled him and realized that he is teaching at Oberlin College. So the organized wrote a letter by uh, Mr. Kaveh Shahruz, our lawyer, that he also lost an uncle in that massacre. Uh, and 50 family members of the executed in the, during 1980s uh, signed the letter, plus 600 more people from all walks of life, uh, political activists, uh, human rights activists, and American and Iranians. And we demanded for Mahalati to be fired. Unfortunately, the college ignored us. Uh, of course, the first semester in the spring of 2021, they didn't let him teach. But the next two semesters he taught, but then they put him on leave again. But they never interacted with us, agreed to talk to us. And the 
organized different protests all around. And uh, I want to thank especially Mr. Benjamin Bainthal that from the day one that we issued our letter, he was on the news. He's the only reporter that asked the college to answer and give a, tell us that what they think about our letter uh, on the first day. And since then, he has stayed on the story and helped us to expose the college as a college that is uh, that Mahalati and the college as anti-Semitic and showed the, all the documents of the UN that he spoke against Baha'is, against Jewish people, against Israel. Uh, and also he had uh, defended the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. So all of this uh, later on, of course, I want to thank also Ben Baird and Susan Johnson and Cliff, uh, Mr. Cliff Smith for getting involved in the campaign and helping us to expose this man as the uh, the two-faced <laughs> um, person that he actually is and helps us get him uh, to put on suspense forever. Let me ask you one other question. You mentioned, you know, sort of how the campaign got started. Um, other and obviously, you know, his role as UN ambassador and covering up a mass atrocity is one thing. Do you believe he presented a danger in the U.S. and what kind of danger? Of course, he's a dangerous man. He's an ideologue that believes Shia Islam has been uh, exported all over the world. And since the start of the revolution, he has done that. His father was a Ayatollah, was a clergy, and he had become a clergy in year 2000. He has a mosque in Iran, and when he goes to Iran, he's wearing that cloth. In U.S., he hangs out with the uh, suits, but in Iran, he wears actually the cloths of them and uh, teaches at the mosques. Uh, he writes books that they are all about the peace and prosperity that we all all know that actually Islam was spread by the sword, not by peace and prosperity. And he also defends Hamas. He also um, hates Israel, hates Jewish people. And he knows very well that there is no freedom of religion in Iran. And he lies. And he he also defended the fact that against Salman Rushdie as freedom of speech in a country that people at, um, get shot and killed, even children for speaking up. He never, ever spoke against the Islamic regime, and that's shameful. Um, let me say one thing before I get to another panelist. It took a lot of work to get Mahaladi suspended, and it wasn't just one factor. It was a whole ton of factors. Uh, we can't be for sure, at least at this point, why Oberlin ousted him. They've been pretty tight-lipped about why. Um, they've given very little information. However, it seems likely that just it's the sheer weight of all the different things that have happened that ousted him. And so a lot of people played a role in that. And so I'm going to talk to each one about different parts they played. And so you can kind of get a more complete picture. Uh, Susanna, uh, you were the one who discovered not Mahalati's former regime connections, but current regime connections, as shown by his own statements. Uh, you want to discuss what you found and why it was important? Sure, I, I think that uh, that's that's an important point that uh, there's certainly evidence that looks like Mahalati could be a current regime um, operative. Uh, throughout the years, he has he has at at times when it certainly it served his own interests. Uh, and Lauren, please, you know, chip in if you think this is if I if I'm off base here, but that he has throughout the years maintained ties pretty clearly. Um, and for one thing, when he first came to the U.S., uh, he got a job at Columbia and he got that job right after Columbia had received money from the Alavi Foundation. And at the time, Mahalati's brother was head of the Alavi Foundation. The Alavi Foundation, as you know, was since prosecuted by the U.S. government as a front for the regime. So even that right there, you know, it's like there's some I mean, you could make an argument there. He's just using his, you know, regime ties to get a job here. And, you know, maybe that's all it was, but maybe it's something more than that. And can you imagine a job not having some kind of political influence if the regime orchestrated your position at a school? Is there not some kind of, you know, political tie still there? I think it's a question we should ask. Um, later on, uh, but much more recently, uh, in last summer, and it was actually Hamid Sharkar, uh, who has also been working on getting getting Mahalati uh, removed from o Oberlin. He's worked a lot with Laudan. He brought to our attention that that Mahalati was on the board of a journal, a prominent journal in Iran, Sefer Isayazat. And this journal had other regime operatives on the board with it. But, you know, they they praised Hezbollah as a regional ally uh, that was really important. Um, some other things that Mahalati has done, he wrote an article where he uh, praised, um, I mean, he was saying that he was important to the regime for spreading Shia Islam. So just as, just as Laudan was just saying, 
uh, in 2018, I think it was 2018, his name was smeared and he was uh, put on a list of basically traitors to the regime. And he wrote a letter to the regime saying, hey, look, I am really important in the West. I am I'm working at the school as an academic. I'm, pr- I'm spreading Shia Islam for the regime. Uh, and, and we've documented that. So if anybody wants to read that, you can click on one of our articles and read more about that. But uh, he's made it pretty clear that he's he's not just some guy that not only covered up a massacre for the regime, and there's plenty of evidence about that, but he's also gone on to say, hey, I'm still doing your work. And that's horrifying uh, that he would still be a professor in the U.S. Yeah, uh, I want to you mentioned the fact that you that he wrote a letter to the regime openly discussing his usefulness for the regime it is a fact that was cited in a congressional letter which launched a congressional investigation into Mahalati. Uh, I had a hand in discussing that with Congress at the time, um, as did others at the Middle East Forum. Do you, and you're a former congressional staffer. Do you want to speak to how you think Congress looks at facts like that and sort of this wider problem? Sure, I think uh, it's very significant. I think it's, it's really, uh, I think that foreign influence on college campuses is a very big deal. Uh, China has certainly gotten a lot of attention that not our purview within this conversation, but it's not just China who's doing this. Iran is doing it. And we've, you know, Mahalati is just one person who is involved in this. Uh, I think that anytime actual evidence can be, you know, even this something that might seem really small, like someone's name being on the, jur- the, the board of a journal, um, that's something that congressional staff would be very useful for them to know. So if If you have information and you're watching this, let us know, Um, because Congress said, you know, they can take all of that, all of those facts and do things that, you know, it's not in our power to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to Benjamin Weinthal. Uh, Benjamin, you have been at the forefront of calling out Mahalati for anti-Semitism, among other things. Uh, Do you want to discuss how you got started on that? Well, yeah, I, I, um, was following uh, the uh, tweets at the time in um, October of 2020 from Kava, who's a lawyer for the uh, campaign, Ira, to oust Mahalati. And I, I knew him um, from, from previous work um, or from his work against the uh, Islamic Republic. He's a Canadian-based attorney. He's very prominent. And I thought this was just a a sensational story in the sense that um, I had never um, experienced a high-level regime official who was being accused of um, crimes against humanity, according to an an Amnesty International report. And I I knew of Oberlin College um, because my sister attended Oberlin. Um, and uh, I knew a lot of people from my high school attended Oberlin, and I thought this this story has uh, um, a lot of potential uh, to attract readers and and um, <clears throat> serve the public interest. And that's when I, I wrote about the story initially based on the tweets on from Kava outlining what the the campaign was about. And then Lauden and I got in touch. Um, Lauden went a few months later. I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly the chronology. Uh, you're on mute, but I think it was a few months later. And uh, Laudan uh, um, really uh, heightened my um, awareness and and educated me about the 1998 massacre, which I'd reported on before, but Laudan is really the expert on this and knows just, um, I mean, she's just, you know, could write dissertations about the 1998 massacre massacre and she's written extensively about it so that clear that helped me with my uh it helped inform my journalism and um and then she turned out to be this this as kava said the other day on twitter a force of nature i i think that's the best way to describe laudan's work in terms of um mounting this uh pressure point campaign to aus mahalati over the last uh, three years um and and um yeah and then the story just can continue to produce we continue to advance the new story through the research of ira through laudan's research through um iranian americans across the united states sending me information about mahalati as part of this campaign um and who 
who were doing uh, just outstanding research. Um, as as a, as, a, as a journalist, I wouldn't have been able to uh, find all these different aspects of the story, including um, the uh, Mahalati's tirades against uh, Baha'is, and he laid the um, really the the genocidal campaign to purge Baha'is from Iran at the UN when he was ambassador between 1987 and 1989 and his calls for a global jihad against Israel at the UN and his calls for the, the dissolution of the Jewish state. Um, <clears throat> so again, this material just continued to come, including the Solomon Rushdie um, revelations that Mahalati endorsed uh, Khomeini's fatwa against Solomon Rushdie, I believe in 19. 88, if I'm not mistaken, and um, it just continued to bounce from uh, new story to new story about his about um, his uh, work at the UN and his his uh, academic role at at Oberlin. Let me ask you a question about that. As you know, um, this seems to all this reporting on his um, alleged anti-Semitism um, has seemingly spurred an investigation. By the Department of Education, we have a letter to the effect of that it was investigating Oberlin um, due to, of anti-Semitism, due in part to Mahalati. Um, do you um, do you think that how what big of a role how big of a role do you think this played in his ouster? Does anybody have an opinion on that? Well, I think you know. I, I mean, I've discussed this with uh, many of the Iranian Americans on the uh, committee uh, with uh, Benjamin Baird and others, um, and I. I, I, I my sense is based on previous board reporting that it was probably a cumulative of effect of all the different news stories that were coming out. Clearly, Mahalati's reputation was profoundly damaged and he was isolated in Oberlin after Laudan, um, you know, it turned it, it turned the Mahalati story into an international story. And, and everyone seemed to know that this was someone who, uh, covered up the mass murder of 5,000 Iranian political prisoners in 1988. So he was turned into a pariah at Oberlin. Students boycotted his classes. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Cliff, uh, this anti-Semitism investigation uh, came out in uh, uh, just, it was reported on in November that the Department of Education is investigating Mahalati and the college for creating a, a hostile environment or uh, sexual, uh, excuse me, uh, harassing Jewish students and promoting uh, his his pro Hamas views on the campus. But I'd be curious to hear what the other folks on the panel yeah. think about well, that. Very get, important. We'll get to that. One last thing, uh, as we already pointed out, on top of the media campaign and sort of you know social pressure campaign, on top of a congressional investigation and a Department of Education investigation, Ben, you brought up perhaps the final issue about Mahalati, and that is. While he was at Columbia, he was sued for sexual harassment, and that was covered up for decades. Do you want to talk about um, how you discovered that and uh, what you discovered? Yeah, I think it's really important to start with how we came to know about the fact that Mahalati was involved in a sex for grades scandal. Um, this information was not easy to come by by any means. Uh, in the process of conducting a background check into Mahalati, Using open sources, we saw references to a 1997 court case where Mahalati and Columbia University were each listed as co-defendants. Uh, but we couldn't see the actual case files because this was in the 1990s uh, before the mass digi digitization of court records. Um, so the files actually had to be retrieved from an abandoned mine shaft in Kansas, 60 feet underground, where it was stored with other forgotten and inactive uh, government records. So I, I just want to point out that it's highly unlikely that these files and, and these allegations would have ever seen the light of day after the court case ended, uh, if not for the actions of our team and, and cooperation with ARIA. Um, so once we delved into the case files, we were absolutely shocked at what we discovered. Uh, Mahalati was involved uh, in a 16-month affair with a, uh, a graduate student that was 11 years younger than he. Uh, he allegedly provided the students with academic benefits, inflated grades, in exchange for sexual favors. Uh, Mahalati first met the plaintiff in 1993 at Columbia University, 
Uh, he took classes at Columbia at this time, but he also taught uh, one class per semester in the School of International Studies. Uh, the plaintiff uh, stated in the files that shortly after they met, he invited uh, her to a dinner at his home. Um, and it was at this dinner that he first uh, started with his advances and she rebuffed them. He was quite aggressive, but she said she wasn't interested in a relationship. Uh, it was later after she left his home uh, that she called and left several voice messages on her answering machine. Um, and it was here that he proposed a quid pro quo sex for grades relationship uh, with this graduate student, which was also a research assistant. Um, by the way, we've spoken uh, behind the scenes with the plaintiff in this case, and we believe that it was these voice recordings uh, where Mahalati basically incriminated himself um, uh, the plaintiff held on to them and presented to them, um, and we believe that's what moved Columbia University to settle with her. Uh, but it's important to note throughout the relationship, Mahalati was known to be abusive to the student. Um, he would not only be abusive to her, but to women in general. Um, he constantly warned her against discussing news of their affair publicly, um, and when the student finally uh, broke off the relationship with Mahalati and reported it to Columbia authorities, Mahalati responded with retribution. Uh, he started circulating rumors that she had plagiarized materials and uh, was involved in other academic fraud, um, which of course uh, defamed her and was probably very difficult to handle. Um, it's also important to note that when she brought the allegations to Columbia University, um, they never notified her about the ongoing investigation, um, what, if any, penalties would be imposed on Mahalati um, or, or anything like that. And in fact, uh, in their answer to the amended complaint, Columbia University actually blames the victim and says that she's culpable for her own conduct here. Um, anyone with knowledge of these um, uh, unequal relationships uh, in a work or education setting can tell you uh, that she's certainly not culpable. She could have feared retribution if she didn't do it. This professor asked of her, um, you know, th that's just how uh, such relationships work generally. Um, so eventually when she saw Columbia wasn't taking any action, she brought the lawsuit. Um, Mahalati did not want to show up to court. Uh, they tried to serve him on many occasions and he would not show up. Um, and it wasn't until they were going to uh, do a summary judgment and just pay, have him uh, force him to pay without a trial uh, that he finally uh, started showing up and then um, to try to claim diplomatic immunity, which we can discuss if you'd like. Yeah, I was going to say that was the next last question I had before we go to questions. So um, everybody, if they have questions, please type it into the Q&A box and we'll get to them. Um, but before we do that, I was going to ask, you found a very interesting document um, that is perhaps relevant, has relevance even beyond sexual harassment in the sexual harassment lawsuit claims. You want to discuss what you found? Right. Um, so in order to get out of this lawsuit, um, there was a letter from uh, the, the Iran, Iran's permanent mission at the United Nations claiming that Mahalati was actually a special advisor to Iran um, and that he enjoyed diplomatic immunity. Um, the letter was actually dated December 1st, and it said that he started as a special advisor on December 8th. However, this is long after his relationship with the student. And it was even after um, the case was brought to trial. So he was trying to claim uh, diplomatic immunity retroactively, it appears. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that would legally work, um, but it shows, it really shows the lengths to which the regime would go to protect one of its own. Um, you know, Mahalati's faced accusations for a long time of being part of the regime. Um, and it turns out that he was working as a professor and potentially moonlighting, um, you know, as a regime proxy. Um, 
And even if that's not true, the, uh, the, the alternative would be that the regime lied about him working for the regime so that he didn't have to pay, face judgment in a U.S. court. Well, either way, I think is what that really says is that he is still p- part of the he is a regime agent, no matter which way you, you slice that mm. either he was working for the regime officially or he wasn't. And they invented a re- some sort of position just so he could claim diplomatic immunity, which, is, of course, shows that he was still working for the regime either way. Uh, anyway, we'll get to questions. We have a couple. We uh, would like more. Please uh, type them into the Q&A box. Uh, one, we, one is... Um, um, people are asking us, how did Malati end up at Oberlin? I would uh, like to answer that question. Um, uh, Mahalati, when he left uh, Iran, uh, when he left his post as a Iran ambassador to the United Nations, he stayed in U.S. and he started getting involved, creating mosques, religious centers. And uh, he realized that uh, since Iran has a 2,500 years history, he can use our culture in a way to gather Iranians around with pretending that they are a cultural uh, institution. And they created several cultural institutions and they um, also joined forces with a woman, Olga Davidson. She's a professor in Harvard that studied uh, Persia, Iran, and your Persian language. And she has written several books. So she helped him a lot, uh, one of the useful idiots that helped this regime uh, and their expansion in the United States of America. Uh, Mahalati has thanked her in his um, uh, so for, so-called PhD, that is not even a real PhD, um, re, uh, what do you call it, research that he wrote. And uh, so together they they would they would talk about Shahnameh, our poets, our culture, our New Year, uh, Noruz, you know, and create programs for that. And at some point they um, they they bought a building and recreated it just like Iran with tapestry and um, uh, fabrics and things like that, and would invite people. The two of them were behind inviting Khatami, pre- Iran's president, to come and speak in the U.S. universities and around. And there's a picture of Olga Davidson and Khatami sitting on a sofa next to each other, very cozy. And they invited, Olga was connected to a lot of rich Americans that she was inviting to these parties to get them to give money to them. And um, we contacted her, of course, she, she never answered us. Uh, so using all of that connections, then these nonprofit organizations that was supposed to bring a cultural um, understanding between uh, countries, they got involved and they tried to bring Iranian students to the United States to do this exchange. And the people that worked in that nonprofit happened to be Oberlin's uh, former students, two of them. So they reached out to Oberlin president and Oberlin president became the first U.S. college president that traveled to Iran after 20 some years. And unfortunately, Miss Nancy, uh, Nancy Dye, uh, she really felt, of course, she fell in love with our culture, but she was tricked by the so-called reformist of Iran uh, and thought this, this connection will really help. And that's why he hired Mahalati. Mahalati was one of the people that was involved in this connection of exchange student, which never materialized, but it landed uh, Mahalati a job at Oberlin because one of these nonprofit organizations uh, gave presidential award to Oberlin, $100,000. And the president put pressure on the um, on the one of the professors of the college to hire Mahalati, which he was telling them. All of them were saying that Mahalati is not qualified. He hasn't written anything. He is not qualified. So finally, because the president was paying for it, they are accepted to hire him for a year. But after that, they let him go and they hired another professor for the position. So the, so the Oberlin president created a special position for him that God knows who's paying for it. And that's another thing that we couldn't get to the bottom of it since since a private college, we can have uh, information about their fundings. Uh, let's go to the next question. Um, Eric Selkov asks, what do you think Malati will do next? And do you think he'll go back to Iran? Anybody? So I can just jump in with a quick answer here. I think he's already in Iran. Uh, in Shiraz, he, um, you know, he has roots in Shiraz. His father was a respected imam, uh, part of the clergy. Um, and I think he's in Iran right now. Uh, whether or not he'll stay there remains to be seen, but I think it's safe to say that he will not continue a career in education. 
Yeah. All these the years he had been, uh, I, I like to add that all these years he had been living in Iran for six months of the year. Uh, he has a mosque there, he has a school there, and he just in last June, in June of 2023, he had invited uh, all the clergy that are pro Khamenei, uh, pro IRGC, and they have issued several statements against United States, against killing of Qasem Soleimani, against President Trump and all the others. Uh, so he invited them to his mosque and there's a picture of him bowing toward the one that has a higher uh, post in the regime. So it's really, really shameful that such a man gets to live in the United States of America. Uh, another question um, from, I, I may butcher this name, Shirha Jesselson um, is asking, Will his suspension have any relevance to other teachers at American universities who are shills for other Islamist groups? Uh, I will uh, mention one thing on this myself, and that is that um, it was um, it was a big step for Congress to investigate uh, Mahalati uh, about a year or so ago, um, and that and I think Congresswoman um, Virginia Fox and Congressman uh, Jim Banks, who started that, deserve a lot of credit. Um, and this is not the only one. Just um, a handful of weeks ago. Um, 12 members of the Education and Workforce Committee, including uh, Virginia Fox and um, Congressman Banks, along with uh, 10 others, sent a letter to Princeton to um, go after, um, ask basically for an accounting of Professor Masavian. Professor Masavian is also a former um, ambassador for Iran, um, among many other things. He is basically a lifelong regime flack. We've written about him as well, and we are continuing to press on that as well. He is quite clearly, I would argue, still a regime agent. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we are definitely hoping so. But if anybody else wants to jump in and discuss sort of maybe some of the wider implications of that, I'm glad to hear. I'm sorry, I like to add that this brought so much hope between Iranians. I received thousands of messages from Iran that they are saying, you made our day, you know, you made our mouth sweeten, which is an expression in Farsi, and they're all very happy. So at the time that we felt defeated after the Women, Life, Freedom Revolution, that we were all hoping that it will topple the regime. And unfortunately, with the help of United States of America of releasing them tons of money and with the Europe not putting IRGC on the uh, terrorist list and things like that. Unfortunately, the the fire of the revolution has slowed down a little, but this brought a lot of hope. Now we see that in Canada, uh, people are trying to get uh, all the members out. They gave already to the Canadian government the list of 70 people. Uh, IRIA, our group, is also going after Musavion in Princeton University, and we are going to go after the other ones. And this put everybody on notice. I can tell you, I, I'm just here at uh, Oslo, Norway, for participated in the uh, Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. And I saw Shirin Nebadi, the other recipient of Nobel Prize Iranian, that she also wrote a letter to Oberlin. So she thanked us for our, for our efforts. I saw Mehran Gizekar, that her daughter is an Oberlin uh, graduate. She thanked us for everything she did. Which, uh, <laughs> I was happy that she encouraged her daughter to help us with writing that op-ed. I saw all kinds of uh, you know, lawyers, I saw the Amnesty International representatives, they all thanked us that we used their report to get to where we are. So I'm saying this This just created so much buzz, so much uh, hope, and I'm sure we can do a lot of great things with the help of everybody. And I thank again MEF, uh, Benjamin Bainthal, Ben Baird, and Susanna and you, Cliff, for all you, the time and efforts you put. Ben took us to meet all the lawmakers in Ohio. He put the time and effort. And all of these helps you asked earlier, what was it at the end? They had to, Oberlin had to hire a PR responsible for this because they realized after we are saying, you have a professor that is involved in the crime against humanity. He's involved in anti-Semitism. He's in, uh, involved in hating Baha'is, he's involved in, in uh, supporting a fatwa, you know, they didn't have a choice. And then, of course, the last nail in their coffin was Melissa Landos, Co Berlin College grad, uh, former graduate, that she also filed uh, this claim with the education department about the, his, his support of Hamas that really brought them to their knees. And they decided, even though for the last year he hadn't taught at all, they decided to make it formal and formally announce that he's not going to teach anymore. <clears throat> yeah, um, I will. Uh, so one, uh, Gigi asks, isn't Oberlin a nonprofit agent uh, uh, organization? It should be possible to get information about its school donations by foreign entities. Um, I will actually mention that because that's something we I've worked on a little bit. <laughs> Just last week, um, Congress passed 
something called the Deterrent Act, which um, we have advocated for for quite some time. It would require significantly more disclosures and put real teeth behind enforcing disclosures of universities. However, currently, it is actually surprising um, just how little they really have to disclose. Right now, in theory, universities have to disclose, oh, we got this much from a foreign entity, um, and that's it. They don't have to say what the money's for. They don't have to say who's controlling it. They don't have to say much of anything, really. And, and that's only ones that are explicitly foreign. And even that, the law really isn't enforced. The only thing the law can currently do is they can force um, someone to uh, basically pay the government's lawyer's fees if they successfully sue them. Um, so right now, it's really difficult. It might be in theory possible to get information on their foreign donations, but it's it's very difficult in practice, and it's more or less voluntary uh, at this point. So we're very happy that bill passed the House. We hope it'll pass the Senate, be signed by the president, so on and so forth. Uh, but that's where we are on that now. So we don't really know that much. It's also worth mentioning that the Alavi Foundation, is, uh, which we mentioned before, is actually a U.S. foundation. It was found to be a regime entity, but it wasn't for years. It was not considered such. So there would have had no legal reason to do that. This is a big web. It's very difficult. Um, so anyway, that's um, that's where we're going on that. Um, wanted to say one other thing. Um, J.R. Pride asks, are you aware of any similar situations involving universities in Canada? Yes, as I mentioned, there are several of them, and uh, Canadians Kaveh Shahrus is actually one of the lawyers that is working on it because Kaveh resides in Canada. Uh, there are a lot of Iranians in Canada that they're united. They started a nonprofit, and they're going after them. Maybe Benny can talk about McGill, some of his work there. Benjamin, sure. Uh, just quickly, um, uh, Mahalati um, um, purportedly completed his PhD at. McGill University in uh, Montreal, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, received information. Um, I actually did some research, and we determined that McGill uh, has a uh, had a partnership with Tehran University. McGill has an Islamic institute, and um, that uh, partnership was eventually uh, ended, according to McGill. They wouldn't tell me when, but I did write an article in the. Uh, uh, National Post, a Canadian uh, newspaper about the uh, the partnership. You can find it online. And uh, then Laudan also gave me information about the Alavi Foundation funding McGill. Um, it, and that money, uh, we weren't able to find a crystal clear connection between Mahalati and the funding that Iran's regime sent to McGill. But it certainly raises red flags that uh, he would suddenly show up at McGill and uh, earn his PhD. And there are question marks over, again, over his academic credentials. Um, more research need to, needs to be done into his uh, his uh, academic works because uh, there's, a, there's a sense that some of his writing is not, uh, and his scholarship is not on solid ground. Yeah. Um, an anonymous questioner um, wants to ask, um, after Oberlin took disciplinary action against Mahalati, how likely is it that he will face further repercussions for his involvement in crimes against humanity? Susanna, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that some of you know what we've talked about, about the congressional stuff ties into this, as well as what Ira's been working on. And I think that it's it's fantastic that he has been put on, you know, administrative leave from Oberlin, but the fight here is far from over. Um, he needs to stand trial, uh, you know, publicly for the crimes that he's been accused of. Uh, and hope that, you know, we can have real justice here, not just him, you know, basically being fired from Oberlin. Uh, and for that matter, we don't know exactly why he was fired, you know, or I should say uh, removed, put on administrative leave uh, by Oberlin. And along those lines, we need to make sure he's not reinstated at Oberlin. Of course, you know, I was, you know, working really hard on that. Um, but if I were, you know, still on the Hill, which I'm not, I have nothing to do with Congress now, but if I were still there, I would make sure, you know, we want to keep, you know, Congress should keep asking questions. They should follow up on their investigation that they started and keep pressuring like, hey, you know, this is not resolved here. Oberlin still needs O's answers to Congress. My understanding, Cliff, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Oberlin never actually responded to Congress. Do you know if they did? 
I, I have not heard of their response. Um, so yeah. I, 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 I know that there is a lot to be done in this space. And I do know through conversations I've had with different congressional actors that this is something on their radar, that there's still questions to be answered by Congress. Yeah, I think, and I, you know, and I, I know Lauren wants to add some, add some remarks to this. I'm sure about making sure that Mahalati is ultimately tried for the crimes that he's been accused of. Yeah, I'd like to add that this is not enough uh, whatsoever. We want a memorial uh, at Oberlin for the fallen, uh, our fallen loved ones, and we also want a course to be taught in Iran in Oberlin College about the atrocities of the Islamic regime in Iran and around the Middle East. The Islamic regime of Iran is the father of Taliban and the grandfather of ISIS, and the reason of all the. Uh, turmoil in the Middle East, and there must be responsible professors that they teach this, and so students understand what kind of brutal regime, gender apartheid regime we have been dealing with. Also, we have other lawyers that have helped us that we complain to the immigration department because we are sure that he lied on his immigration applications to become a U.S. citizen, and we hope all of this uh, become fruitful and he sees some kind of justice. Um, let me ask another question here. Um... Don Sable asks, while this does not exactly pertain to Oberlin, do any of the panelists have thoughts to share about former Biden administration, Iranian negotiator Robert Malley and the folks he brought into government who are being accused of Iran, Iranian support agent and to agents and so on and so forth. Um, I will mention one thing in that it's not, a, it's, I don't think it's an accident that Robert Malley, the second he got ousted for government for, you know, accused malfeasance on classified material, that he ended up at Princeton. Um, Princeton is the same place that houses Masavian, the other ambassador we were mentioning that is now getting congressional, location, um, congressional attention thanks to uh, Congresswoman Fox and Congressman Banks and, and 10 others. Um, there's a real problem that goes beyond just one man or just one university. Does anybody want to speak to Mali and uh, his uh, malfeasance and how this suit fits into the education um, and foreign influence department? I'd like to add that Mahalati's sister and Mahalati's brother-in-law, another clergy, also teach at Princeton and the brother-in-law also in Colombia. And I also like to add that Mali's closeness with the Islamic regime and his hate for um, Israel and stuff is totally aligned. These, these so-called leftists that they are anti-imperialist and anti-America, they all align their um, their wishes with each other. That's why he could be so close to the members of the Islamic regime. And I, I'm sure if we dig more, we can find a lot of problems about Mali. But we are going after Aryan Tabatabai and other people in, in his team that they were in the White House and they were helping. And we hope that the um, Biden administration uh, listens to our cries and gets rid of them. Indeed. Anyone else want to add on to that? Um, let's go to, um, let's see, there's a whole bunch of questions popping up now. Um, um, does anybody find, here's one good question, another by Gigi. Um, does anyone think that um, it's unusual, perhaps, that a university did not inquire as to his um, sexual harassment um, charges, like that wasn't discovered before? Ben, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, it should have come up in a background check. Maybe not all the case files, as, as I discussed earlier, they would have had to have ordered those, but they could have seen very clearly that he was involved in something as a co-defendant with Columbia University, um, and, it, it, and it identifies him as both as a professor and as an individual, um, you know, is how the charges or the lawsuit was um, uh, placed against him. Um, so they should have found it. Um, Oberlin College, when asked, claimed that they had no prior knowledge uh, of his involvement in a sexual harassment claim. And they stated that if they had known that, they would have never hired him. Um, you know, I don't know if that's true. Um, you know, there were uh, a news report, an interview in uh, early, uh, I believe it was no early October where it was mentioned, his sexual harassment case. Um, but when we sent a press inquiry, they claimed to have no, no knowledge of it. Um, that's not an excuse. Um, it speaks to the wider problem of vetting procedures in, in colleges and at Oberlin College, for sure. Um, you know, and tenure policies, for that matter. Um, there needs to be reform. 
uh, we need to take a closer look and not just for criminal or, or legal aspects, um, but also for foreign connections. Indeed. Well, uh, along those lines, you're, you're talking about um, just the foreign connections. Uh, it seems like that raises a lot of questions about um, how Mahalati got that job in the first place, you know, which Laudan's talked about that earlier. You know, it's like, did they not do a background check on him? You know, was he, you know, did he just pull some strings or someone pulled some strings for him and he got that job? And those are those are questions that we just don't have answers to right now. Yeah, I know. I, I think this is in, it's an interesting question because um, Laudan mentioned uh, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner, Shireen Abadi, an Iranian jurist, who uh, accused Oberlin of whitewashing its investigation of Mahalati. So after all the disclosures came out about Mahalati uh, covering up the mass murder of 5,000 Iranians and his, his genocidal anti-Semitism and his uh, genocidal rhetoric against the Baha'is, Oberlin conducted a so-called independent investigation. They hired a lawyer from who is a from their a board of trustee member. So there was an inher inherent conflict of interest, and their investigation whitewashed Mahalati's crimes. And they posted a fact sheet on their website. The fact sheet was uh, scrubbed from the website, we believe, last week. And Oberlin has never dealt with the fact that they defended, in many ways. Mahalati's uh, conduct over the last um, um, 30 plus years, and they've never apologized for their defense, or as Abadi said, and others, uh, their whitewashing of his um, crimes against humanity. And those are big questions that need to be addressed. And Oberlin has gone into bunker mode, and they just simply are vehemently in, it, opposed to any semblance of self-reflection or engaging the Iranian-American community about these very serious questions. And I find it unbelievable to this day that they won't meet with Laudan and the other Iranian-Americans who have been persecuted by this regime. Yep. But that's President Amber of Oberlin. And, you know, it would be interesting if Congress hauls her in for an investigation and asks why uh, Oberlin has tolerated anti-Semitism for so many years and tolerated uh, a genocidal maniac, according to critics, namely uh, Mohammed Jafar Mahalati. And with that, I believe we will have to go. We're already over time. Sorry to all those that did not uh, get their questions answered. It was a law very interesting investigation and a difficult topic. We appreciate all your attention and we thank you all for your questions and please come back for more webinar events uh, later this week and, and into the end of the year. Thank you very much. Bye.